Well, thanks everyone for, for joining the talk. I am really looking forward to this one. Uh, Ryan Orndorff is going to be talking to us about functional programming and dependent types. So Ryan, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah. Hi everyone, my name is Ryan and uh, the title of my talk is Functional Programming Plus Dependent Types is Equivalent to Verified Linear Algebra. That's what that little triple bar symbol is sometimes called. So a little bit about myself. Um, so I am currently a research scientist at Facebook Reality Labs Research, uh, where I work on uh, human computer interaction research. Previously, uh, what I used to do was a lot of medical imaging, specifically something called magnetic particle imaging. And so I was working on trying to basically verify that technology. But on the side, I have a passion for theorem proving programming languages and dependently typed language, languages, which I think a lot of us share, because um, they're just so fun to use. And they're just a very like interesting way to think about programming that we don't necessarily get in our kind of day-to-day -day programming lives, but maybe soon. Um, and then there's a link for the repos. I have to add a slight disclaimer that uh, none of the work that's presented here is related to in any way to my employer, past employers, future employers, anything like that. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, with that, we can get started. So the goal of this talk is that we wanna create, uh, basically do linear algebra through functional programming in a way that we can say that we have, a, we have defined matrices in the correct way and we've done it where we can make no errors. So we'll go through what that means. Um, some ways that this can come up and some of the more, uh, the most common way in which people talk about this is that you can basically have improper sizing for matrices. So say you define a matrix as just a list of lists. Um, this list of list characterizations of a matrix doesn't necessarily enforce that the matrix has um, equivalent numbers of elements for each row, which is required for a matrix. So in this example, the first row that we have has uh, three elements, and then the second row has two elements, which doesn't form a uh, valid matrix. <clears throat> Another challenge is that you can also have improper data types in the sense of linear algebra. You can always make a table of tables, like a 2D data structure of something. But for specifically for linear algebra, it doesn't always make sense to just put anything in the matrix. So for example, you could have a maybe value inside the, like your definition of matrix, but that might not make any sense. And then most, uh, yeah, and most data types don't actually like really fit into the definition of a matrix. And there are a few more uh, that we'll get to later that may be surprising and exciting. So the first step to try to think about how we would define a matrix and kind of like deal with it in Haskell is <clears throat> um, we would basically construct, oh, sorry, this talk will be in Agda. So we'll go through this. Um, the way, main way that you can think about it is that you would have a list of lists of something and then you turn that as the data type. Um, all syntax will be in, in Agda unless otherwise specified. So this is the Agda syntax, which is kind of like the GADT syntax. Um, in Haskell, you can think of this equivalently as you as just using a standard data constructor. So matrix of numbers is just you define the data constructor function and then um, the type that goes in there. So say we wanted to define this matrix, which is a, a two by three matrix, um, we would just write it out using our constructor that we've defined. So we decide that name was construct matrix of numbers. And so in order to define the two by three, we basically give it each row independently and the number of elements in this case does match. So we've done it correctly, which is always exciting. And then just one note for like, um, as we're talking about uh, stuff that uh, different parts of the talk. So whenever you see A, it's mono space font. Um, Anything that's kind of in the italics mathy font is a matrix like with the big M and then M, N, P, and Q are natural numbers and then U, V, X, and Y are um, usually vectors. So if we wanna define our matrix, which we've done already for that like list of lists variant, there's kind of three main operations that you can do on a very basic level with matrices. The first one is apply a matrix to a vector. So when you multiply a matrix by a vector, it will give you a new vector as an output. Another thing that you can do is you can transpose the matrix. So the transpose of the matrix is basically you take, and when you think of it as a table of numbers, is you take the diagonal and you flip all the numbers that are on opposite sides of the diagonal. So anything that's on, say, the bottom left corner of the table, after you flip around the diagonal, will now be on the top right. Um, and it's really just like you take the index for each value, the ij index, and you return it as the j i index. So that's a common and base operation. And another thing is that we combine matrices through matrix multiplication. So we can take two matrices and uh, smack them together in order to form a new lovely matrix that we uh, has the combination of both uh, of the original inputs. 
So um, just kind of like as a basic kind of reminder, when you're doing matrix multiple matrix vector multiplication, really what you're doing is that you're taking each row of a matrix and you're element wise multiplying it by the vector and then adding those values up and calling that a new value in your uh, resulting vector, which is what this demonstration shows. Um, but another way to really think about this, instead of thinking about it as just a whole bunch of multiplications and additions, is to think of M, in this case, this matrix, as a function that takes in vectors of size three, that returns vectors of size two, uh, always of the same type in this case. So in this case, they're all, well, they look like integers, but we'll pretend that they're real. Um, <clears throat> and sometimes this function also has this, uh, we'll give it a name. So it's sometimes called a linear map. So instead of saying a matrix, you can somewhat equivalently say that you have a linear map from one vector space, which is a vectors of a certain size, to another vector space, which is vectors of a different size. So if we think about matrices in terms of this functional version, if we're thinking about in terms of linear maps, we can identify kind of some base matrices that are really easy to think about to kind of give us an intuition. So the most easy matrix uh, one could think about is the identity matrix. And what the identity matrix does is that uh, because each only the diagonal is ones, what it has the effect of doing is just copying the matrix, uh, copying the input vector and returning it to you having done nothing. So it's the equivalent of the identity function. This means that uh, if we were to write out this matrix as a function, it's really just the identity function. And we can write that quite easily in Agda um, by just returning the input that we've been given. A little bit more complicated of an example to give you an idea of like another way that you can think of the functionalization of a matrix is that if the diagonal is filled with numbers instead, it's equivalent to multiplying the input vector element wise by a different, by the elements on the diagonal. Um, so when you see the star here with the V that's element wise multiply the two vectors and the U is basically the combination of all those U1s, U2, U3, U4, U5, to UN. So if we were to write this down as a, as a function, what we would show is that the diagonal function is element-wise multiplication of the two vectors. Uh, alternatively, if you wanna like look into the kind of base of how the element-wise multiplication works, it's really just a zip. So uh, in here, we're zipping all the elements of the U vector with the V vector and multiplying them together during that zip. Uh, one thing to note kind of with Agda is that Agda takes an extra parameter here that's a type level parameter that we actually don't really need to uh, worry about currently. But this is how you would define this function, this matrix um, as a function. So now that we've gotten a kind of some of an intuition about what we're thinking about uh, in terms of functional versions of matrices, uh, let's codify it in a data type. So here we can say that we have a functional matrix, which is takes a as its parameter, a function from list to list, and then returns a functional matrix. <clears throat> so now we can construct a matrix using this, and we're really we're just dealing with a wrapper, right? So we can use our list identity function, which is exactly what we would use to construct, say, the identity matrix. Um, <clears throat> so then the question is, um, does, is this complete? Is this correct? Is, is this matrix vector, uh, what else can we do with it? So remember, there was the three kind of things. There was applying a matrix, which is exactly what's in the, defined in the data structure. Uh, what also we have is matrix matrix multiply. So to do matrix matrix multiply, really the definition of that is to apply the first matrix to a vector, take the output vector from there and apply it to the second matrix, <clears throat> which is defined in this equation. So uh, one thing that we'll need to do first is just kind of define the apply operator, the matrix vector multiply. So for that one, we've just called it dot with an F above it. Um, and all that does is that it just takes out that function from the matrix, the F function, and applies it to the, the list that we have. If we want to apply two matrices, uh, then what we can do is that we can basically just use our now uh, ve matrix vector multiplication um, operator and then apply it twice. So here, because of the fixity, uh, basically, we can just write it out exactly as it is on the top line. So we can say that the vector V that starts in gets multiplied by M2, which will give us a new vector. And that resulting vector will be multiplied by M1. Uh, and that will give us our final result. Um, but one thing to note is that this actually looks a lot like function composition. Uh, and there's a good reason it's because it basically is. Um, so if we want to construct a combination matrix that has the properties of 
uh, M1 and M2 doing this, or doing M2 first and then going through M1. All we really need to do is partially apply our apply to matrix function um, with the two matrices that we have as an input to a new matrix. And we've now generated one that's the compound version, basically the function composition as that new matrix. Uh, the one last thing that we haven't quite tackled is that oftentimes you need the transpose. So of these three base operations, that one's actually pretty easy. Uh, you just add another function to your data structure, which basically encodes the transpose function. Um, so now you have two functions that are coming in pairs. And so if you want to construct the identity function, now the uh, transpose of the identity function, since it's all zeros except for being on the diagonal where it's all ones, uh, is itself is uh, self-adjoint. So that means that the transpose function is the same as the forward function. Uh, so we can construct that with our new data constructor, construct f and p. Throughout this talk, we'll do intuition checks just to make sure that we're kind of on the right ballpark for actually encoding correct linear algebra. Um, so the kind of question is, is can we take uh, whatever, like, can we encode a matrix in our new definitions that we're doing, the functional definitions, and define something that can't be done by just uh, adding and multiplying, essentially? So with our list function, um, that certainly, our identity function on list, that certainly works. Um, and we can rewrite it as basically replicating a vector of ones and then element-wise multiplying those by the input vector. So that's our kind of, we have taken our function and converted it into the form that uh, is equivalent in terms of only multiplications and additions. Um, so if we're trying to get to this, uh, correct by construction, do we have any problems with our current definition? Well, there is some problems. One of them is that there's really kind of no specification that the uh, function for the forward actually preserves any size or does anything correctly with the size of the input. Um, and so here I've just returned an empty list. You can think of also maybe functions that would investigate the list and return different sized lists. But basically the challenge is that if I want to write that out with a series of numbers, I unfortunately can't because I'm taking data and I'm investigating it and then potentially throwing pieces away. So uh, anytime you're kind of thinking about, oh, if I can like think about a vector or like interrogate pieces of it, that's probably not actually a matrix. It's not a function that can go into the, our matrix definition. So we have a challenge here. And the question is, can we solve it? Um, so the standard way to do this is basically to uh, add in at the type level the size of the vector so now instead of being list you have vectors um, and the vectors in this case are parameterized for natural numbers but you can think of it as um, somewhat any a that goes in there um, and the size of it so here we've created a vector of size three um, and if we try to uh, then assign or say like convert it to a vector of size two, Agda will basically like honk at us and say like, hey, like the number three is not equal to the number of two. And I don't really understand what's going on here. So it will stop you, which is nice because then uh, the compiler is helping tell you whether or not you've done the correct thing in terms of at least the shapes of, of vectors. And anytime you see a vector operation, it'll probably have a superscript D. So that's why the uh, square braces have that. So, uh, and vec is a dependent type because the type of the, uh, the type depends on the specific value. So in this case, the uh, the value is the actual list and the size of the list. And the, since the size of the list is encoded in the type, it is therefore a dependent type. Um, yeah. So we can now basically take our prior data constructor definition. And what we can do is that we can just, instead of having our forward and transpose functions, and sometimes transpose is called adjoint, uh, what we'll do is just replace them with functions that work over vectors and sized vectors. So now we have a matrix, and we'll call it size matrix, that's parameterized by m by n. So it's m by n matrix, where the forward function basically takes a vector of size n and returns you an m. And then when you transpose it, the matrix becomes an n by m vector. So you essentially, the transpose function is to go from m to size n. Um, and then you can create a, a data structure that way that encodes this. And now you can no longer encode the case of um, you investigating or looking at a list and trying to change different sizes or just returning empty. And what's kind of nice about this is previously, if you wanted to check for any of that, it'd be a runtime check. Uh, in, in this case, now it's a compile time check. So it's nice to know that the compiler will kind of have your back. Um, this actually comes up a lot. This is one of the primary challenges, I think, um, at least in a lot of my work is that oftentimes it's just I've made a silly mistake and I have like a slightly wrong size or I've plumbed things slightly incorrectly and it's, it's really helpful to not kind of run into those errors way down the line. 
Um, if you were to think about this in terms of Haskell syntax instead of Agda syntax, it's essentially the same uh, using like the GADT syntax. Uh, the only things is that there is, uh, you include natural numbers as part of the type uh, definition. And then also you have to have this constraint that's a no nat constraint, which is somewhat to help help Haskell um, understand what to do with the natural numbers once you actually try to use them in practice. But the definition is mostly verbatim. Um, so uh, let's do the identity function again. That's gonna be our favorite because it's the easiest one. So now if we wanna do uh, the um, identity, uh, we can construct the, we can just pass the actual identity function in. The reason why this works is because for at least for, uh, well, for Haskell and for Agda, um, since we the identity function will return whatever its input is, it will also return the correct vector with the correct size attached. So now we can construct an identity matrix that ideally is closer or is correct. So let's do another intuition check just to make sure that we're kind of like on the right track or if there's anything that we're missing in our definition of having a, a matrix that is truly defined per the rules of linear algebra. So uh, what happens if we were to take our data type? Currently, it's always of type A and we were to give it something that's not a number because we've been thinking about numbers for a while. Um, let's think about some card, no, card suites. So if we define a data type that is the suite of the card, then we can construct a matrix uh, filled with spades and hearts, right? And in this case, replicate what it does is it just makes a vector of the same size of some size uh, with that element constantly uh, in that vector. So this doesn't really pass our intuition check because if you're trying to do matrix uh, addition and multiplication on card suites, it doesn't exactly make sense. You can certainly define, say, like a like. Uh, like a modulus system or something like that, but there seems to be something funky going on here. You can include kind of almost anything, um, IO and stuff like that, as long as the size was the correct. Um, so matrices clearly can't contain just anything um, and their elements specifically have to have the ability to be added and multiplied. So what are we gonna do for that? Um, <clears throat> the reason why uh, matrices, like we normally think of them in terms of numbers is because they're defined actually in terms of a different structure called field. Um, and a field is really just a, generaliz is a generalization of numbers in a certain way that has like some nice properties. Oftentimes these, the associated properties are related also to a ring. Um, but the basic properties of a field are that, and this is Agda syntax for a record, but this is another way to construct a data type. It's just, you list out the components instead of using the arrow syntax. Um, you need an add function. You need a multiply function. Um, you also need a inverse function for the addition. So you need something that takes an element, say like four and returns to negative four. And you need an inverse operation for the multiplication. So in this case, it's the, uh, to the negative one, like one over operation. And so like if you had four, the inverse operation would be one fourth. Um, and you also need identities for both of your new operators, addition and multiplication. Um, so oftentimes, uh, just for convenience, because it's in most fields, the identity value for plus will be zero and the identity value for multiplication will be one. So with this, what we can do is we can now somewhat like type classes, constraints and stuff like that, we can constrain in Agda using this curly brace notation to say that we can only accept values that are of a field. Um, so that's where this kind of part comes in here where it says a field. Um, and otherwise our definition is the same and everything that we could do before in terms of putting a forward and adjoint function in there um, will work just fine. Um, and if you were to write this out in Haskell, it looks also this uh, similar, uh, you'd have to enable some extra stuff in order to, I think, uh, in order to add this field A constraint, which is part of the like GADT way of thinking about it syntax stuff. So, but otherwise, if you write it out, it's mostly the same. Um, so with this, we can construct a ideally uh, correct, and the question is, are we still there yet? <laughs> um, correct version of a matrix from a functional form standpoint with the identity function. Now, in this case, again, nothing really needs to change because the identity function in this case went from A to A. And when we add this uh, constraint in the constructor, we're basically saying that the identity function is now only gonna work over elements that are part of a field. Um, so in this case, now we can define something where we can't put in say, unless we define a way for card suites to be part of a field, we can't include it here in the definition of our functional version of a matrix. Um, so let's do an intuition check again as to whether or not we're actually there. 
So again, we need to make sure that the matrix that we can matrices that we can define are equivalent in terms of linear algebra and somewhat equivalent to real number matrices. So what happens if we define a matrix like this, where we basically the forward function, so when you take a vector in and you multiply it, what the output vector is, uh, and the transpose are both uh, just always return a value of one. Um, this is a challenge for linear algebra, because since you can only do additions and multiplications, you can't just always kind of return a constant. You can't maneuver your way into not investigating the values that are in the vector itself. So every always the vector that you put as an input will uh, somehow have to be, every element will have to be touched, whether or not that's by zero or some other number as part of the output. And you can't really like decide or look at anything again. So why, uh, how do we basically encode the fact that we have this problem where we could take some input vector and just always return a constant output vector of the correct size, but we still have a problem. So the properties that we're missing are some um, two basic ones. Uh, and they're basically how you define what's called a linear function. So a linear function has two properties. One of them is linearity, which basically says that if you take the function and you apply it to um, u plus v, it's the same as if you applied the function to u, applied the function to v, and added the results afterwards. And here the plus with the v at the top is uh, element-wise vector addition. And then it also needs homogeneity. So homogeneity means that basically if you multiply a vector by a constant and then you apply your function that should be the same as applying your function to the vector and then afterwards multiplying by a constant so for our old constructor which basically always returned constant we can see why this doesn't work so for linearity if you just do the left hand side where you add the two input vectors first and then apply the function you'll always get the uh, a vector filled with ones however if you do this where you break apart the addition and you apply your uh, function that always returns ones to u and then v and then add the result, you'll always get the vector two. So the results don't match. And for homogeneity, it also fails on that regard because what happens is that if you take a constant uh, and multiply it to the vector before you apply the function, you'll still always get ones as an output. But if you did it the other way where you apply your function first, you'll get a vector of ones and then you'll multiply that by the constant uh, that you have and generate a vector that is always filled with that constant. So at that point, um, the two sides don't match again. So there's that's kind of where our new matrix definition fails. So how do we fix that part? Well, we're going to now get a little bit, it's going to get like a lot more complicated all of a sudden. So now we're going to have to, instead of having our functions for the forward and transpose being functions that just take a vector of some size and returning a vector of another size. Now we need to make sure that those functions that we give as an input follow some properties and that they actually are valid. So what we need for that is we need the original function that we were thinking about putting in there. So a function from size M to size N. And now also what we need in order to say, put in the correct function in Agda in this Agda definition is to provide a proof that the linearity property is with is held, upheld. So what this, next line says is that in order to construct this uh, linear arrow, which is the bar with the circle at the end, we need a function, we need to provide a function that given any two input vectors, u and v, of uh, the same size, that when you apply f to u plus v, it's the same as f of u plus f of v, and the triple bar is equivalent to, basically, you can read, read it that way. Um, and the other thing we need is the homogeneity. Um, so we need to be able to prove that the homogeneity property is withheld in order to provide, create a linear function. With this, we could define our matrices as basically what we had before, except for now, instead of defining them in terms of just vectors of size, um, of functions that go from vectors of size M to N, we can now basically define them in terms of linear functions that do the same. Uh, and in this case, the um, A part is kind of alluded or is, um, collided from the definitions here in terms of the linear arrow down here because it's already defined implicitly. Uh, well, that's what those curly braces mean. So uh, what is this triple bar equals thing? Um, really what it says is that uh, two things are equivalent and that you can kind of replace one with the other. If the left and the right side can be written in basically the same way with the same order of data constructors. Um, so 
yeah and the definition the technical definition of it is actually quite simple um but the or it looks simple it's actually remarkably when you think about it there's like some teasers in there but all all it is is that uh to say that two elements of the same data type are the same you have to uh, you can construct that with the REFL um constructor which will then tell you you have a proof that these two sides are the same um and that they basically evaluate down to the same series of constructors um so um with that we in order to like kind of get to our linear function definition what we're going to need to now talk about is also our field came with not just uh, the fact that it was addition and multiplication and some identity elements and stuff like that in there but also there's properties there's proofs related to a field so a field is only defined if you actually have these. It's not defined if you if you just define those other functions, you just have a collection of functions, which is nice, but they need to uphold these properties. Um, so they're mostly what you would think about. Um, addition is associative, so you can kind of do addition in any order. Uh, it also commutes, so A plus B is B plus A. Um, you can add to the zero element and you get back the element you put in and that the uh, inverse function actually does what it says. So the inverse function returns to you the identity element for addition. And all these are like uh, are proofs. So you will generate at the end, you will generate a proof of the quality between these two different types of things, or you will need to demonstrate it. Uh, for, for multiplication, it's the, basically the exact same rules, just like put in the multiplication signal and you use a, the associated identity and inverse elements for multiplication. And then the one rule that ties them together is the distributive law. So basically, multiplication distributes over addition, which is to say that if you have a times b plus c, that's equivalent to a times b plus a times c. Right. So these are all now that now we have a full definition of a field. We have the functions that go into the field, and we have the properties associated with the field. So in order to generate a, to define a, a say that a data type adheres to a field, you will now need to prove these properties. Uh, and let's go through a little bit about how you do proofs in Agda, um, since it's not something that's uh, quite the same in Haskell. Um, so basically proofs in a simple way kind of begin like this. You say like, so you have some property that you want to prove in the type. In this case, I want to prove B plus the zero, uh, zero element multiplied by the one element is equivalent to just the B. So you start with a, it looks like a very much like you're writing it out. So you start with begin, and then you say the first line, and then you say the transformation that you're going to apply to the uh, proof in order to get to the next step of the proof. So here, what I'm saying is that I'm going to basically apply the proof of uh, multiply by one is I is identical. And what that will allow me to do, so this says I want to apply this multiply by one to this left hand side to basically say that I have b plus zero times uh, one. And then that will allow me to basically remove the one component because that's the proof that I'm trying to use. And so then that allows I can do that rewrite. So now I have B plus zero. Then the next rule I want to apply is our uh, base rule of plus zero is the identity element for, um, or sorry, zero is the identity, identity element for plus. And so we apply that. And then the result is we get just B. And then we end with a nice little Q, QED square that says that, yay, we've like we've made it. But basically, essentially what this is doing on the back end is that it's taking proofs and it's chaining them together. Um, and that's how you would mostly do algebra when you're doing it by hand you kind of have those steps and you're like okay i'm going to rewrite this equation and do this and this and this so this is just a more formal way or more um, verified way of doing it on a computer so now if we want to get back to our like our canonical matrix that we're trying to define which is the identity matrix um, we need to define a few things we need to define it first as a linear function so the linear function here uh, is the identity function that we've been using but now we need to make sure that it actually follows the uh, linearity and the homogeneity rules. So in order to construct this, let's start off with the linearity rules. Um, what this shows, uh, basically all this says is that to prove linearity, we give it a function that takes in a U and a V, and then we give it a, take out a proof. In this case, the proof is just reflexivity itself. That's what REFL stands for. And the reason why is because Agda is pretty good about basically understanding. It's like it tries to apply the definition of your function as many times as possible until you can get to as simple a form as possible. So what it does is it says, OK, on the left hand side, I have ID of U plus V. So I already know that ID X equals X, which means that I can just replace that there. And so it, go, it just gives you back U plus V. And then on the right hand side, it does that for each ID of U and ID of V. And then it can easily then see that U plus V is equal to U plus V on both sides. Um, 
the homogeneity property is actually also proved, proved reflexively. Um, so in this case, this proof is like quite simple. Um, when you apply the identity function again, it basically all ID of some vector turns into just that vector, and then Agda's happy. Um, and now we can say that we've defined a linear function, which we can then put into our definition of the matrix. So, sorry. Um, let's go with a slightly more complicated example because not all proofs are that nice. Uh, so the diagonal function, which is the one we had before, was you take some input vector, in this case, we're calling it D, and where element Y is multiplying it by um, the value that comes into the into the matrix, the vector that comes into the matrix. So to prove linearity, um, basically what we'll need to do is that we'll need to show that the um, the everything that we have defined in terms of fields before, that the distributive property in terms of fields, where you had A times B plus C, now works on vectors. So now you have the vector D element wise multiplied by uh, U element wise added to V is the same if you distribute it over. So you can basically plug in that proof and we'll go through that proof in a second. Um, and then there's a similar proof basically for um, the homogeneity, which basically just says that you can uh, swap them around, um, but they get a little long. And so I kind of want to go into that a little bit. So let's go through the, uh, the distributive one. So the distributed version, basically um, you define the type here to begin the proof like we had with the v plus zero plus one uh, times one. And so what we want to prove is d times u plus v is d times u plus d times v. Uh, and then you define a function like you would just like in Haskell with a, a base case and then inductively uh, defined. So here um, we define the base case as all the empty vectors. And in which case, all of these things just turn into the empty vector of vector of size zero and we return a reflexive result. Um, and that's the proof of that. Basically, I was able to say like, okay, when I plug in all these things, I just always get the empty list and so, or the empty vector and so, um, and it's the empty vector on both sides. So it's able to figure that out. Um, one thing to note is that actually the other base cases where you could possibly think about, so like potentially there's a base case of like two of the element, two of the vectors are zero and then one of them has size one or something like that, right? Um, those actually don't exist and you can't write them down. And the reason why is because since they're all of size N, uh, it restricts you. So in this case, they all have to be the same, since they all have to be the same size, you actually only have two cases, which is kind of nice. Um, so here, the second case is basically you have uh, every vector has like some first element and then the rest of the vector. Um, and remember all these input vectors are the same. Uh, and the double colon bit here being um, concatenation. So the uh, what happens is that you uh, start your type, which should mostly match the thing on the left. In this case, Agda does some nice things where it allows you to kind of pre-apply all the stuff that it can figure out. So what it figures out is that um, we're going to basically start off with uh, D, the first element of D times the first element of U plus the first element of V, and then concatenated with a every that same process that's happening, but for every other element. So now, in order to apply a proof uh, to this and the and get towards our end result, what we're going to do is we're basically going to start off by implying applying the inductive hypothesis, which says that we assume that all prior in uh, iterations of this process have been proven true already until um, we get down to the base case. So this first part, uh, congruence is what it's called, but basically what it allows you to do in this case is just to select the part of the equation that you want to actually provide the proof to. So here, what I'm saying is that I want to apply the proof to where this little underscore is, where this hole is, which is equivalent to this part here. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply the function that I'm defining right now in order to say that it inductively allows me to basically distribute over the vector for all the elements past the one that's on the head. Um, so that ends up looking like this, just written out. And now what we'll do is we'll do, we'll focus on the front of the list and then we can just apply the field operation. So this uh, here, again, this is the, we're going for where the underscore is. And now we are applying basically, this is the field proof that we've provided since we're uh, defined over vectors. We know we have a, uh, we have a field constraint in here. Um, and so that allows us to convert this into D time, B times U plus D zero times U zero plus D zero times V zero. Um, and then there's a um, handy little, like if things can be, if Agda can figure it out, you can also just kind of leave this empty brace, which is equivalent to reflexivity, uh, which allows, basically saying that Agda figured out how to go from like this last form 
all the way up to whatever you started with. And so then you have the proof. You have the proof of uh, linearity for the diagonal function, essentially. You'll need to do this for your homogeneity and any linear function that you define that will then go into it. So now we've gotten to a point where when we're defining matrices in a functional way, there, there really are a lot of requirements, but we really get, we're like much closer to being able to say like, we've done it correctly, or at least the forward function at this point, we're like, we're, we're really nailing down like that we like cannot make any errors when we construct the matrix when we think of it in terms of functions. Um, so again, now that we've like proven these things, the construction for uh, any of these matrices is really quite simple. Once you actually have the linear functions, you just apply them. And the question is, have we, have we finally reached it? Have we reached our nirvana of we cannot define this matrix incorrectly when we think of it as the matrix in terms of a function? And um, uh, we do have like, we'll think of one final case here. So the one final case is that what happens if we've always been dealing with the identity function, which the identity function has a forward and transpose that match. So uh, in this case, what happens if they don't match? Does that make sense? Um, and the answer is basically no, they should like match up in some way. So there must be some property that says that these two match. Um, and in order to uh, solve this, basically what we need to say is that uh, there's a certain product uh, operation called inner product, uh, but you can kind of just gloss over that. Basically, uh, the concept is, is that um, for any input vector, it, for any two input vectors, you should be able to take the inner product of X and the function applied to uh, Y, and also it should be equivalent to the inner product of Y with the transpose function applied to X. So those two sides should always be equivalent. And the inner product is just defined as the sum of the element-wise multiplication of the two vectors. So with that, um, we can actually uh, finally reach our goal. And I'll just tell you that this is like the end state. <laughs> so we, it took a while to get there. Um, so now what we need is like, in order to construct a matrix, basically what we need a few pieces. We need a linear function for the forward uh, to define the forward function. We need another linear function to find the transpose. And now we need a proof that this inner product property is upheld um, for all vectors that you could put into this function. Um, so if we have it, so let's go with the identity matrix again. Um, the identity matrix is, we already had the definitions of linear functions for identity, so we can apply those. And then the last part is that we need this, this proof, the uh, proof that the identity transpose is correct. So we'll define that here. The where clause is similar to the uh, Haskell egg where clause. And the proof is, um, in this case, somewhat simple. So uh, basically, you start off by taking the inner product of the two pieces. Um, and then you one of them has the identity function already applied. You reduce that to just x and y. And then you show that the inner product is the same, that it commutes. You can either do x and y and y and x. It doesn't matter. And, Intuitively, that should make sense since it's the sum of the multiplication of the two inputs. It kind of that inner multiplication of the two inputs doesn't really matter. And then you just show as a final step that uh, a vector is the same as the identity applied to that vector. Um, so now we've defined a full matrix with linear functions as the input and a proof that our two input functions actually are uh, congruent with each other, that they make sense. Um, so we had a few properties we had before in terms of things that we wanted to be able to do to the matrix. And we wanted to be able to uh, apply it to something. We wanted to be able to transpose it. And we wanted to be able to matrix matrix multiplication. Um, so can we uh, implement, we have basically the matrix apply and the matrix transpose are the same as before where you could um, like pull out the element and then switch the vectors and stuff like that or switch the functions. But the, what we really want to focus on is the matrix matrix multiply. So we'll build up some tools to get there. Um, previously, we had this, which was just composition. So that's what we're going to kind of go for, is that we're going to go for composition, but in terms of a linear form. Um, and so to do that, we need two pieces. This is the uh, matrix to a linear function, which just extracts the forward function. Um, and then we can apply the forward function as uh, and extract that piece as well. Um, so that's how you would actually eventually use it. Um, and then the other thing that we need is an ability to transpose. So in, normally, instead of extracting the transpose function, what we're doing here is that we're actually generating a new matrix with from an m by n matrix to an n by m matrix, where we flip the two functions as the input. And now we need to provide a proof that this 
function, this new matrix, this transpose matrix actually also does make sense. Uh, in this case, this final proof, what it's basically saying um, is that in the sim is for symmetry. So we had a proof of the um, inner product property before uh, where we had say like the proof, uh, proof of X and M of Y and Y M of X on the other side. But now we need a proof of basically everything where everything's reversed in some sense. Um, and so the, since it works out, but just by symmetry, this proof actually ends up being easy. But whenever you um, are basically taking matrices and smacking them together, and there's a few ways to do that, it's not necessarily this easy, um, but you will have to generate, use old proofs. That's what this is doing. It's taking the old proof function that applying to X and Y, getting a proof and then performing symmetry. But you'll need to do something like this for every combination if you want to like combine matrices in some form. Um, and then here, uh, we basically also need a way to compose, since we said that matrix multiplication was composition, we need a way to compose the internal functions, the linear functions. So here, the definition is what you would think. It's the composition is just applying the two functions in series uh, with, in this case, the, comp the application function is uh, the dot with the L above it. And since this is a new linear function that we'll need to do in order to put into our matrix multiplication, we'll need proofs for that but they're actually pretty long. So at this point in the talk, I've uh, replaced things with trust me. Um, everything is listed in the repository that's associated with this talk. So you can go and look up what the proof is, uh, but they do get quite extensive. Um, so now we can define our matrix matrix multiply. And basically uh, it's uh, what it is is that the forward function and the transpose function are basically just extracting out the linear functions and then composing them. So that's what this one does uh, here, say, we're extracting out M2's linear function, we're extracting out M1's linear function, and then we're composing them. And then we're doing the same with the transpose here. So instead of extracting the transpose function directly, we're transposing the matrix itself and then extracting its forward function, since the transpose is just, is just rotating the two functions around. And then there's an associated proof with this um, that gets a little bit involved. Um, so what have we gained from like this encoding? So um, there's a, quite a few values to defining a matrix in terms of a function. We can define performant uh, functional versions of this and performance is something we'll talk, I'll demonstrate in a sec. Um, and we can guarantee that our implementation is correct. So uh, if it's a matrix of numbers, then uh, certainly like you will kind of reach most of the properties that you want just by having the size vectors and you can kind of stop there. But if you have the functional version, then uh, you do need these other properties in order to like really nail down that you've done the correct thing. Um, and so we now have all those properties in place that we require. Um, and additionally, we've shown that you can use equational reasoning, reasoning to prove that two implementations are correct. So anytime that there was a proof, you were basically showing that some left-hand side, you could be rewritten as a right-hand side which is helpful for uh, a lot of algorithms because potentially there's a more performant form of something that's just a rewrite of an existing form that you know of. Um, so you can basically prove that your two implementations are correct by stepping through the set of rewrite rules required in order to get from A to B. Um, but there is a cost here that I've been kind of alluding to. Uh, for just one example in the library that implements this, which is an Agda library called Functional Linear Algebra, um, for that file with 213 lines when I originally wrote this presentation, uh, 24 lines were actually like defining the actual functions and uh, like how they work, what, whatever it was. So the identity function, the diagonal function, whatever. And everything else was uh, a type signature, which doesn't actually occur that much as uh, really the big burden there is the proof. So you were spending about maybe 10% of your time defining the function itself and 90% of your time proving that you've done the right thing. <laughs> so. Um, I mean, at that point, you don't need any unit tests or anything like that. So potentially that works out in your favor, and especially if you're working for something where you're trying to do something that, where you're certifying that the result is correct, say on some safety critical system, this could easily be a worthwhile trade-off, but it is a trade-off that I wanted to mention. So I'll just briefly end with kind of like some algorithms that use linear algebra in this form uh, that have used the functional version of linear algebra. We gain a few benefits basically from writing out the uh, functions in this manner. And what, basically what it is is space and time, because matrices, since they're just a kind of list of numbers and you can do things with sparse matrices, are really pretty um, 
they're pretty uh, inefficient in some ways and for certain cases. So for example, for the identity function, you're doing matrix, you're doing a bunch of additions and multiplications that you don't really need to do. You just need to return the input. Um, so in my prior work, I worked on something called magnetic particle imaging, which was basically tracing where iron tracers went within the body, which is the, in this case, in a rat on the right. And it was using the imaging device on the left. Uh, and there's a, basically a model, a, a functional model uh, that you can encode as functional matrices that allows you to convert from the distribution of iron on the right into the uh, set on the left. So um, into the like voltages that you would get on the system. Um, and if you do this, what you end up getting is like an incredible amount of improvement in terms of performance. So the amount of space required to store these matrices goes down to bytes from what was previously hundreds of gigabytes. So you get nine orders of magnitude there. Uh, the amount of time to compute, because actually you can define more efficient versions of these operations, also went down by a factor of 30. And the fact that you're using functional concepts is, of course, priceless and always exciting. Um, so in order to basically do um, this, we convert a function, or we have this function that converts iron distributions into voltages. Um, and we produce this as a matrix M uh, and we have it defined functionally. Um, and what we need to do in order to like, basically say we have the voltages, how do we reconstruct the original iron distribution? Um, we best, basically what we do is something called gradient descent. Um, and uh, since I'm not, in uh, I'm a little bit out of time, so I'll like just kind of briefly skip over that, but basically it's a step of like, you kind of guess and check until you get better. Um, so the way you do that is that basically you, um, you're you always like guessing at what the particle distribution is and then reproducing the voltages. And then you're, you tweak what your guess is based on basically the uh, uh, gradient of the slope. It's somewhat similar to like gradient descent or sorry, newton raston and, and stuff like that. Um, and then you just iterate. You just keep doing this a bunch of times. Um, so there's a question, kind of question of like, I was trying to say like whether or not there's a proof um, or you can do rewrite properties. So here I've defined that kind of cost function, the step function here. Um, you can actually do things like now we can say we have this, this function that allows us to go from one estimate of our say iron distribution or whatever, and we can make a better one, um, but we can actually like expand it out. Potentially the expanded version is more, um, it either gives you access to um, other functions that could be combined or something like that. But we can use basically, proofs in order to say that the steps are the same. So in here, the proof is uh, something that's also defined in the, in the linear algebra library um, that basically like puts these pieces together um, and allows you to show that the two definitions for your linear algebra algorithm are the same. Um, so have we reached there? We've certainly reached there. We've eliminated all the wrong size bugs, all the nonlinear function problems and the incorrect uh, function pairing bugs. And then the last point I want to point out is that I've actually implemented this idea three different times. So once was as a Python library, which had no guarantees. Once was as a Haskell library, which had only types, uh, sized vectors. And the final one was the Agda library. Uh, and the basic like output is that, um, or the basic concept here is that you can um, kind of trade off ease of use. The like Python version is very easy to use, but it's very incorrect. It's very easy to get wrong. Um, and so there's kind of like different steps. And the, Haskell version is actually, I think, like kind of the best because the size thing takes care of a lot of what you need without the proofs of linearity and stuff like that. And then you can go to like the way extreme of Agda and like kind of do like everything is proven and all the implementation is correct. Um, but it just requires so much proofs that it like really, unless you kind of like need it for a specific case, um, it's, it's a very high bar to entry. It's very hard to use, but you get like guaranteed correctness, like 100% correctness. 